Mount Rushmore National Memorial, America's beloved shrine of democracy, is one of our country's most inspiring patriotic sites. But it's actually far more than that. It's a personification in stone of basic American ideals. In addition, the story of its creation affords a superb example of artistic drive on a colossal scale. And far from least, it's the focal point for visitors to a major vacation land, the Black Hills of South Dakota. The pine trees and craggy granite peaks of the Black Hills are a dark island in the vast rolling sea of grass that stretches from the Missouri River to the Rockies. These mountains were thrust up by geologic action over millions of years and in the process became laced with hidden precious metals. Further passing millennia saw the erosion of these mountains into pinnacles and canyons. From a distance, rising above the almost featureless prairie, these hills and their deep green forests look black indeed. The idea of creating a gigantic carving here was first proposed in 1923 by Doan Robinson, South Dakota state historian. He invited Gutson Borglum, a prominent American sculptor, to the Black Hills. Borglum's previous work indicated that he could plan and execute sculpture on a heroic scale. The area was searched for a suitable location. Originally, Robinson had envisioned a memorial to some of America's notable Western figures, Lewis and Clark, perhaps, and John C. Fremont. It would be a fitting tribute, and it would also attract visitors and aid the state's economy. But Borglum believed the proposed monument should be of national, not regional, significance, and suggested the lists of several presidents. At last, the sculptor found the place he was looking for. The site was Mount Rushmore. Its granite was smooth-grained and would take carving well. Its massive cliffs faced the sun most of the day and dominated the surrounding landscape. On October 1, 1925, with a crowd of 3,000 onlookers gathered at the base of the mountain, the sculptor planted a dedicatory American flag on its summit. Four presidents were finally chosen the carving. George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, Abraham Lincoln, and Theodore Roosevelt. On August 10, 1927, President Calvin Coolidge came to dedicate Mount Rushmore National Memorial. He presented Borglum with a set of drills, and drilling began on Washington's face the same day. Conventional techniques of sculpture wouldn't work here. This was the pioneering art of mountain carving, and Borglum was forced to devise new techniques. After the surface rock was carefully blasted away with dynamite, men in slings scrambled across the new surface to chip off excess granite with jackhammers and additional explosives. Here, Washington's nose begins to take shape. When the carving was within a few inches of the finished surface, shallow holes were drilled and additional rock was chipped off with a hammer and wedge. This accomplished the final shaping. The surface was then smoothed with small air hammers. Washington's face, though still incomplete, was unveiled on July 4, 1930.
Borglum, with his son Lincoln working his way up to supervisor, oversaw the entire project. Jefferson's face was begun to the left of Washington's, but fissures were found in the rock and it was dynamited away in 1933. The carving followed Borglum's 20-foot model, with each measurement enlarged 12 times and then transferred to the mountain. Nine changes in the positions of the figures were required as unexpected weaknesses were discovered in the rock. Casts of various sections of the group were hoisted up the mountain's face for on-the-spot measurements. By the summer of 1936, Jefferson's face was ready for dedication and President Franklin D. Roosevelt officiated. Borglum believed that the final sculpture could be a harmonious unit only if the four heads were developed in relation to each other. Carving, therefore, continued simultaneously on all four. There were still catwalks and cables on the faces in 1941 as the memorial neared its present form. The buildings on top were workshops and storehouses. After the initial stunning view of the four great faces high up on the mountain, visitors soon discover that these portraits in stone are astonishingly human and lifelike. The realism of the expressions is partly due to the 22-inch rock projections carved into each eye, providing a natural highlight or sparkle when viewed from a distance. More than 450,000 tons of rock were dynamited from the face of the mountain. That, along with the rest of the granite that was chipped off by hand, still lies where it fell in the man-made talus at Rushmore's base. The volume of the rock removed is about twice that used to construct Egypt's Great Sphinx, and the head of that ancient monument at Giza measures slightly less than the length of Washington's nose. Katzan Borglum, whose genius had designed the monument and whose strength and vigor had brought it into being, died in March 1941. Lincoln Borglum continued the work, perfecting details on the Lincoln and Roosevelt faces and starting on Washington's coat collar. But in 1941, national defense had high priority. Funds for the monument ran out, and work came to an end in October of that year. No further carving has been done since that time, and no more is planned. The four presidents on Mount Rushmore symbolize fundamental aspects of the American spirit. We are descended from people who, in Guts and Borglum's words, fled despotism to people a continent, who built an empire and rewrote the philosophy of freedom and compelled the world to accept its wiser, happier forms of government. George Washington, our country's leader during the perilous years of the revolution and later first president, has the dominant position. Washington represents the struggle for independence, the creation of the Constitution, and the birth of the Republic. No one else during those critical times contributed more to his country's cause. Thomas Jefferson, principal author of the Declaration of Independence, symbolizes government by the people. Jefferson sponsored the Lewis and Clark expedition, which crossed the Rockies to the Pacific, extending the country from sea to shining sea. 
Abraham Lincoln led America through the Civil War and was chief architect of the reunited nation. He represents the permanent union of the states. In his steadfast dedication to personal liberty, he championed equality for all American citizens. Theodore Roosevelt, an Easterner who loved the West, symbolizes the bonds that link our country together. T.R., a vigorous personality and a dynamic speaker, represents the rise of the United States to prominence in world affairs. He knew the glorious scenic areas of the West firsthand. He was one of our staunchest early conservationists and formulated concepts that are still part of National Park Service policy. It's interesting to note that in the carving, T.R.'s spectacles are clearly defined only near his nose and are just suggested around the eyes, yet they're very realistic. Over two million people from every state in the Union and from all over the world visit Mount Rushmore each year. There's a concession in the handsome Memorial View building near the base of the mountain where visitors will find a dining room, a gift shop, and an art gallery. One of Gutzon Borglum's original models for the carving is on display. It shows the figures in a waist-length conception. The sculptor has realized on a spectacular scale Don Robinson's proposal to have a stupendous carving on a granite peak in the Black Hills. The enormous popularity the region enjoys today surely exceeds anything either man might have dreamed of. The entire area has become a vast vacation wonderland as visitors have discovered the superb scenic beauty and the many places of great historic interest nearby. Black Hills National Forest, which surrounds Mount Rushmore, stretches for more than 100 miles north to south along the border between South Dakota and Wyoming. There's a scenic highway here that's famous for its pigtail curves where the road doubles back over itself. Several tunnels provide striking frames for Mount Rushmore. There are lakes and streams for fishing and swimming and a large number of campgrounds. In addition, there's a great variety of entertaining attractions throughout the region. The Hill City 1880 train offers exciting rides between Hill City, a short distance northwest of Mount Rushmore, and the town of Keystone. Passengers in both closed coaches and open observation cars enjoy a two-hour ride through the heart of the mountains and forests of the Black Hills. From mid-June to late August, the authentic old steam train has four departures daily. Picturesque old Keystone, a few miles northeast of Mount Rushmore, was originally a mining camp. There are dozens of attractions here, including many that helped to give visitors a picture of what life was like in a frontier town a century ago. Just south of Mount Rushmore is Custer State Park, one section of which is aptly named the Needles. Scenic Needles Drive, which provides access to the area, passes through two tunnels and reaches elevations over 6,000 feet. In 
It was the needles area that Doan Robinson had in mind when he proposed a gigantic sculpture. But Cuts on Borglum found the granite here too fractured and weathered for large-scale carving. Nature, however, has been carving the rock here for thousands of years. This is the needle's eye, a remarkable natural formation directly beside the road. Sylvan Lake is the oldest man-made lake in the Black Hills and one of the loveliest. It's located in the northwest corner of Custer State Park, just below Harney Peak, the highest mountain in South Dakota. The abundant trout, great scenic beauty, and striking rock formations make the lake very popular with visitors. The Game Lodge in Custer State Park has been a vacation headquarters for both Presidents Coolidge and Eisenhower. It's a pleasant country inn with rooms, cabins, and a fine dining room. One of the highlights of your drive around Custer Park is a visit from the friendly freeloaders, the famous burrows that beg for handouts beside the road, and often right in the middle of it. you'll find they aren't shy about making their interests known. These animals are descendants of the original string of burrows that carried visitors up to the top of Harney Peak way back in the early 20s. They're wild animals now and roam freely here. Custer State Park is also the home of one of America's largest herds of buffalo. By the end of the last century, these great shaggy animals had nearly become extinct, thanks to the thoughtless and terrible slaughter that took place all over the Great Plains. Now, however, through careful management here and in other herds protected by federal and state governments, their numbers have increased. No story about the Black Hills would be complete without mentioning the famous prairie dogs. They can be found here in Custer Park and in many other parts of the region. The squeaky cries and charming antics of these little creatures endear them to all visitors. Deadwood is a famous old mining town that has preserved many buildings from the end of the last century. The town sprang up when gold was found here in 1876, and thousands rushed in to wash the yellow dust and nuggets from the gravel of Deadwood Gulch. It was a lawless, rough and ready place then, and the many modern visitors' attractions helped to create a picture of what life was like here in the heyday of the Old West. Among the most exciting events in Deadwood is the reenactment of the murder of Wild Bill Hickok in the famous Number 10 Saloon, and the capture and trial of Jack McCall, the man who shot him from behind. This realistic drama is presented in the Old Town Hall every night but Sunday during the summer season. Wild Bill, Calamity Jane, and many other colorful figures from those boisterous days are known to every American school child. Now they sleep forever in Boot Hill Cemetery on Mount Moriah in Deadwood. 
The stones that mark their graves are small monuments, but their names alone are enough to conjure up images of a time and a place that can never be forgotten. The placer gold that had brought about the birth of Deadwood and a hundred other towns throughout the Black Hills lasted only a short time. Hard rock mining, a difficult and expensive operation, continued until most of the veins also played out. A few small operations lasted through World War II, and those mine buildings that remain have fallen to ruin. But there is one dramatic exception to gold stories with unhappy endings. The Homestake Mine in Leed is the largest producing gold mine in the Western Hemisphere. The profitable recovery of gold here is possible now only through large-scale operations like this. The Homestake offers fascinating tours of its surface workings, and visitors can report to friends at home that they've actually been in a gold mine. Leed, Deadwood, and Keystone are three of the few towns in the Black Hills that survived the gold rush and have been able to preserve with pride their heritage from frontier days. Wind Cave National Park adjoins the southern boundary of Custer State Park. There's an interesting museum in the visitor center where cave tours begin. Wind Cave was named for the breeze that blows through the entrance, blowing out when the atmospheric pressure outside is lower than that inside, and blowing in when the pressures are the reverse. Although there are few stalactites or stalagmites in Wind Cave, it has several very special kinds of formations. One is popcorn, a knobby white encrustation formed by the evaporation of mineral-laden water after it has seeped through tiny pores in the surrounding limestone. Another far rarer formation is boxwork, natural honeycomb-like shapes. These delicate structures were formed when groundwater, carrying dissolved chemicals, leaked into small interlacing cracks in the limestone and crystallized as calcite. The surrounding limestone eventually dissolved away, leaving these remarkable calcite fins. Geologically, Wind Cave is one of the oldest caves in North America. More than 38 miles of passageways have been explored, and there are still many other sections that have not yet been investigated. Above ground, the park has both forests and grasslands, as well as a large buffalo herd. Jewel Cave National Monument is located west of Custer State Park. Interesting geological exhibits are displayed in the fine new visitor center, and several different types of cave tours are offered. Adventurous visitors will enjoy the spelunking tour for which hard hats and carbide lamps are provided. Many people are surprised to learn that after Mammoth Cave in Kentucky, Jewel is the second longest cave in the United States. There's an abundance of exquisite dog tooth crystals of calcite on the walls of several chambers. These are Jewel's most famous feature. 
In 1906, President Theodore Roosevelt proclaimed Devil's Tower as the first national monument in the United States. It's located in the northeast corner of Wyoming at the western edge of the Black Hills region. The tower rises nearly 1,300 feet above a grassy valley. The huge formation originated underground when a great upward bulge of molten rock cooled and hardened and was later exposed as the softer rock around it eroded away. Its fluted sides are composed of natural columns of rock, many of which have fallen away and lie broken around the base. The monument includes a museum and a thriving prairie dog town. Southeast of Mount Rushmore, leaving Interstate 90 at the town of Wall, home of famous Wall Drug, we approach a stark, weirdly eroded area of deeply gullied hills. This is Badlands National Park. Although there are areas of grassland here and occasional cottonwood trees, it's the landscape with little or no vegetation that attracts the attention of most visitors. Over many thousands of years, these colorful strata of relatively soft rock, both sedimentary and volcanic, have been eroded by wind and weather into pinnacles and gullied hills in an endless variety of strange forms. It's astonishing how the shapes and colors change according to the position of the sun. Lighted from the side, these banded hills take on their most rugged and angular look. With the sun behind the viewer, the wrinkled shapes all but vanish, and the colors are at their lightest and brightest. The South Dakota Badlands are the world's richest source of fossils from the Oligocene epoch, from 12 million to 38 million years ago. This was long after the age of the dinosaurs, but superb fossils of long extinct sea turtles, tiny 20-inch horses, fierce saber-toothed cats, and early ancestors of the rhinoceros and the camel have all been found in the region. At the end of any tour of western South Dakota, the visitor's mind inevitably returns to Mount Rushmore. Many years ago, an eloquent Gutson Borglum best expressed the feelings of all Americans about this national memorial. Let us place there, carved high, he said, as close to heaven as we can, our leaders, their faces, to show posterity what manner of men they were. Then. Breathe a prayer that these records will endure until the wind and the rain alone shall wear them away.